John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and it reads, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but after you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I've been uh, married for a little bit over two years now, and uh, marriage is great. It's, it's such a blessing, but it's also been a intensive crash course on what it means to truly serve someone. Uh, for example, a, a little while back, um, both of my wife and I work, so Saturday mornings, it's our time to get up together and clean the house, take care of the chores, run errands, and all that other stuff. But this particular weekend, uh, we were both busy, so we couldn't get it done. And so came Monday, and Monday is my day off as a pastor. We usually take Mondays off. She goes to work, and on my dis day off, I decide with a happy heart, with a glad heart, that I'm going to do all this stuff for her while she's gone. So, you know, when she comes home, she can just rest. So I go to the store, I get the groceries, I'm going to come home, I'm going to do the dishes, the laundry, the vacuum, the whole nine yards. And I'm doing it, I'm in the middle of it, and she, come home, she comes home from work. And um, she, of course, she's so grateful. She says hi, she says thank you. She goes to the room, she puts her things down, she comes back out, and she heads over to the kitchen. She looks at the drying rack and she's like, what are you doing? This stuff doesn't go here. You need to put it there. She comes back out. She goes to the living room and she notices the floor. She's like, did you really vacuum here? It really doesn't look like it. <laughs> you know, obviously I did a poor job, but you know, uh, all of a sudden this heart, this glad, cheerful heart to serve her, it changed in an instant. All of a sudden I, I became a little resentful and kind of hurt and like, fine, then why don't you do it? My heart had turned into 180 so quickly. And I think this is the case for a lot of us when we serve others, isn't it? It doesn't have to be a spouse. It could be our parents, our siblings, a coworker. We know as Christians that we should serve, and we should serve gladly. But as we do it, we get hurt, we get offended, or we get tired. And uh, it's really hard to continue. And Jesus here today gives us a little bit of help. 
We'll see in today's passage that Jesus gives us an example for service. He gives us the reason for service, and he gives us the ability for service. He gives us example, the reason, and ability. So let's uh, look back into our Bibles to read read verse 1, and we're going to see the example of service in this passage. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his Son who were in the world, he loved them to the end. To set the stage here, the first 12 chapters of James, or for the John, I'm sorry, the first 12 chapters of John is a, like a panoramic shot of Jesus' ministry. Three years in ministry, we see the miracles, the teachings, the healings, all of that. And then here in chapter 13 is a turning point. And what we have is this wide panoramic angle going to this narrow microscopic view of the few hours Jesus spent with his disciples before he headed to the cross. In chapter 2, Jesus said at the uh, dinner party where they ran out of wine that his time had not yet come. In chapter 7, he wouldn't go into Judea because people were after him, so he says, my time had not yet come. And in chapter 8, Jesus was teaching the temple and no one arrested him. Why? Because Jesus said his time had not yet come. But now, Jesus' time had come. It was Thursday night, the day before he started his road to the cross. And what does he do? What does he do at that time? He sits down in the upper room with his disciples, with the ones that he loves, and he serves them. When we look at this Greek phrase at the end of verse 1, and he loved them to the end, there's two ways you could translate this from the Greek. One of them is Jesus loved them to the fullest extent meaning that Jesus gave him his all. He gave him his whole love. He gave the disciples his whole love. And the second way to interpret this verse is that Jesus, is, Jesus loved them to the very end of his life, meaning his love persevered. There was no end to his love. It went from the beginning to finish. And either way you translate it, either way you look at this, this is the love that Jesus had for his disciple, isn't it? There was no period of length. It never ceased. It persevered. And he didn't hold anything back. He gave it all. And so how are we to serve? We are to serve in love. Serve with the love that perseveres and with the love that gives it all. Let's take a look at, moment, at a moment for the, at these disciples, these ragtag group of fishermen and tax collector. They weren't necessarily the best bunch, and they weren't necessarily the most lovable bunch either. They failed to understand Jesus' teachings time and time again. They lacked faith and doubted Jesus, even though they had seen all his miracles right before their eyes. And even at this upper room, before Jesus serves their feet, they're arguing with each other about who is the greatest. You can find this in the the book of Luke. They were hard-headed, There is self-seeking, lacking in faith, prideful, just a very difficult group of people to love. Does this sound like somebody you know? You know, some of you, some people have popped into your head, maybe a coworker, family member, whoever, the person sitting next to you, hopefully not. But (laughs) why don't you tell your neighbor that they're lovable? Tell your neighbor right now, hey, you are lovable. But in all seriousness, these disciples had a lot of flaws, but Jesus' love for them never quit, and Jesus gave all that he had to them. And this is the love that Jesus has for us as well. His love for us perseveres, and his love gave it all for us. And he calls us to serve with the same love. We're going to see that Jesus giving it all also required him to humble himself. Let's read uh, verses 2 to 5 together. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The humility displayed here by Jesus is just remarkable. 
In verse 2, we have Judas. And what does it tell us about Judas? That he is going to betray Jesus. He embodies the prideful, the self-seeking, the one who is greedy and only looking out for their own benefit. He doesn't just fail to serve someone and lift them up. His actions cause death and destruction for others. And we need to take a step back and sometimes ask ourselves, what are we like in our relationships? Are we looking for the welfare of others? Are we trying to encourage them and build them up and serve them? Or are we just receiving, receiving, and taking? And this could eventually cause destruction and bring someone down. And immediately after Judas and his description, we see the stark opposite, the complete opposite contrast. We see Jesus. And in verse 3, it says that he was from the Father and he was going back to the Father and that the Father had given him all things. Now, this is the ultimate status and power, to be from the Father and going back to the Father and have all things given to you by God. With this status and power, you might think that Jesus in an instant would just call legions of angels, come and take over the Roman army, take over the world, defeat Satan, and sit on his throne. You would think he would use the status and power and with the snap of a finger, render Judas deaf, blind, and mute so that he wouldn't be trained the next day. But he does not do that with this status and power. What does he choose to do instead? He gets up, he takes off his outer garment, he ties a towel around his waist. This is the the picture of what a servant was back then. They didn't have outer garments. They tied towels around their waist so they could serve around the house. Jesus takes the stance of a servant, and he gets down, and he washes the disciples' feet, all 12 of them, including Judas, the one that would betray him. Now, to understand the significance of foot washing, um, we got to know a little bit of the historical cultural background. When you were invited as a guest to dinner back then, uh, you would arrive and they would have one of their servants wash your feet because you'd be wearing sandals and you'd work, walk through these dirty roads. And they wouldn't, serve, they wouldn't keep that task for their own Jewish servants, but they would give it to their Gentile servants, their non-Jewish servants, because they thought the task was so menial and so low. And then there are households where they couldn't afford a servant or they didn't have servants, in which case the woman or the children would do the washing of the feet. In whatever case, you would never, ever see someone with a higher social standing washing someone else's feet from a lower social standing. But this is exactly what Jesus was doing. It's like imagining, like, seeing your boss, your hagwon owner, maybe your professor. You go to the bathroom, right? You wash your hands, and you see your boss right there offering you a towel, some mints, maybe a spray of perfume. You would be taken aback. You would be astonished. You'd be like, you don't belong here. This is not your job. You belong in the executive suite, in the office, doing bigger and better important things. But this is what's going on. The Son of God, who has all status and power, lowers himself to wash the disciples' feet. He wasn't above serving, and nobody was below being served. He even served his enemy, the one who would uh, betray him. So serving in humility means that we are not above serving others and that no one is below receiving our service. Jesus was not above serving his disciples, and Judas wasn't below receiving his service. So how are we to serve like Jesus again? We are to serve in love, a love that perseveres, and a love that gives it all. And we are to serve in humility. We are not above serving others, and no one is below receiving our service. Jesus sets the example for us, and he calls us to follow it. Verses 14 and 15, look down with me. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now this passage isn't a command for us to specifically do the act of washing people's feet. A lot of people have interpreted it like that throughout history. But Jesus is calling us to something greater. He's calling us to serve each other in love and humility. 
I know someone, uh, a friend of mine, who came from a very loving uh, home. His parents were devout Christians. They, they loved him and gave him attention. They provide, gave him the best education. My friend, he had no want growing up in life. But as he went to college, he started making bad decisions. He started meeting the wrong friends. He eventually left God. He left the church, and he joined the party scene. He started to dabble with drugs, and eventually it led to a full-blown opiate addiction. Now, he had completely changed, and he went through a very difficult time in his life because of it. But we're going to focus on the parents for a moment in this story. Because of his addiction, they went through some of the darkest times of their life. I mean, my friend, because of his addiction, he would steal. He would be stealing from his own mother's purse. He would steal from stores. There was one time he stole from his own neighbor's house, was caught and arrested. Imagine the shame and the embarrassment for, your, for the parents to have that happen to their child, to their neighbor. Imagine the, the stress, the deceit, the pain. And it wasn't just that arrest. He was arrested for possession, and had, they had to bail him out at 4 in the morning. He totaled two cars that, the, that they had bought. It was just lie after lie, incident after incident, just heartbreak after heartbreak. It was unbearable for the parents. And my friend tells me most people who are in a similar situation as him, other parents threw away their kids. They cut off contact. They kicked him out of the house. They wanted nothing to do with him. But this parent, the mother and father, they were different. They chose to serve their kid no matter what. They gave it their all to serve their son who was going through this terrible time in their life. Daily, his parents would be in prayer, asking for wisdom and strength to deal with the situation. Prayer for restoration for their son. Prayer for deliverance. And over and over, they would forgive and forgive and forgive no matter what had happened. They spared no expense financially in trying to help their son. They put him in. He's been to so many different rehab programs. They sent him overseas to try to get him away from the scene. And eventually, his own parents picked up their lives and relocated to try to save their son. Ten years, this is what the parents went through. Ten years that they, they served with the love that persevered, never gave up. Ten years they served with the love that gave it all. They gave themselves, their resources, their hearts, everything. And they served in humility no matter how many times they were hurt. They were not above serving their child. And no matter what that child did, that child never was undeserving of their service. And this is the service that God calls us to, to love and to be humble and to serve the people in our lives this way. Now, maybe there might not be cases, like extreme cases like this in our lives, right? But there is the boss or the coworker who we can't stand to be around. Maybe serving looks like just don't do what the minimum requirement is, but to go above and beyond to show that you actually do care and that we are a little bit different as Christians. Maybe it's your spouse who, you know, serving them means giving words of encouragement instead of bringing them down with criticism. Maybe it means taking them out to show them that you appreciate every, everything they do for your home. Maybe it's the friend who's going through a very difficult, dark time, and it's just giving them a shoulder to cry on, carrying that burden with them. Maybe it's our parents who we have a tough time trying to understand, and they're nagging, but maybe serving them is being understanding and accepting and loving of them because we're old enough now to take care of them, aren't we? Serving can take many different ways, and Jesus calls us to do this with the people in our lives in love and humility. Now, Jesus telling us to do this should be a reason enough for us to do it. But there's a different reason. There's a greater reason for why Jesus calls us to serve. We serve to restore and help each other grow. We serve to restore and help each other grow. Let's read verses 6 to 10 together. Let's look down. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, afterward, you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. 
And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Remember, I mentioned that John writes with double meaning. So we're going to look at this passage and try to make sense of it, knowing that there's two things uh, being conveyed to us today. Jesus physically washing the disciples' feet was a foreshadow. It was a symbol, a sign of a much greater act to come. The physical act of washing feet was a symbol of the spiritual act of washing sin. So there's two meanings of these words that we're reading today. So if we think about it in the physical sense, when Jesus says uh, that you don't need to have your hands and head washed again, Peter, it means um, we need to know the, the, the context again once more. When you were invited to a dinner party back in those times, you would bathe fully and you would wash yourself and you would be completely clean before you go to the dinner party. So when you arrived you would be clean before your uh, host. Everything would be clean except for your feet because you'd be in sandals and you'd be walking through these dirt roads and that's, hence, that's why they had the servants wash the feet. So it makes sense when Jesus tells them, you're already clean, you don't need washing again, you only need your feet washed. But we can look at this in a spiritual sense as well. And this is the, Christ, the picture of the Christian life. When Jesus washes our sins away, we are completely clean. This is a once and for all final act. This does not change. We are purified before God. But as we walk in this world, in this flesh, we sin along the way. Our feet get dirty. And so we need Jesus to cleanse us, meaning we need Jesus to sanctify us. We repent, we go to him, and he restores us and he helps us grow, mature in in our faith and grow in Christ's likeness. So that is what Jesus is talking about here when he says we wash our feet spiritually, that we are being sanctified. And then Jesus tells us to wash each other's feet. So when we do acts of service, it's not just the physical act of doing good works for other people, for the sake of doing good works. There's a greater reason for it. We serve each other to sanctify each other. When we serve each other, God uses that act to help them grow and to help them mature. We have a greater purpose for our serving. Going back to that story I uh, mentioned about my friend who went through the terrible addiction. I mean, when you looked at his life, Anybody would have looked at his life and just be like, this, this guy's beyond hope. There, there, he has no light at the end of the tunnel for him. He's going to either end up dead or he's going to end up in jail. And that was his own confession as well. It was a life completely destroyed by sin. But praise be to God, it didn't end there. He had lost his jobs. He had lost his savings. He burned all his bridges. He would have been in and out of rehab programs. He was a lost cause. But he wasn't a lost cause to Jesus. Jesus started to work in his life and started to take that heart of stone and soften it. And he began to search after God. And he wanted to look for God again in his life. And and God began to work. And slowly, after time, he surrendered his life back to God again after 10 long years. And he prayed a prayer to God. He said, you have saved me. You are my Savior. My life is no longer mine, and I give it to you. Whatever you want to do with my life, I will obey. And eventually, this prayer led him to seminary. He studied for three years. He graduated. He was ordained, and now he's happily serving in full-time ministry. He was restored, and then he's also, he also got married, and he's happily married as well. Who he is now is completely different than who he was during that time. This is the power of the gospel. Jesus changes everything. He has the power to transform. But as Jesus transforms us, as he changes us, he uses the people around us to make that happen. 
It was the service of his parents for 10 years that led him to that point. It was the service of the pastor who walked with him when he was ready to come back to God that was teaching him and being patient with him and praying for him. There was one friend who didn't abandon him during that time when everyone else was that would visit him and try to counsel him, help him. It's the service of these people that led to the restoration of this friend of mine. And so God uses our service They're not just mere acts of kindness. He uses it to restore and build each other up. Again, we don't do it just for the sake of doing good works. So whenever we're serving, whether it's at the capacity of serving the welcoming team, it's not just smiling and waving and nodding. Who knows how God will use that conversation to encourage someone who's going through a difficult time. There's a greater purpose to the work you're doing. For the tech team, it's not simply about making sure that the mics are going well, you know, the streaming is going well, and the mics are working fine. God has a greater purpose for the worship service that you're serving. For children's ministry, it's not just about babysitting and having fun with the kids. God is going to use your work to plant seeds in those kids' hearts, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how God is going to use it to grow those kids whether it's orphanages or the homeless, our our boss or our spouse, serving is going to look different in every situation, in every case. And we need to go to God asking for wisdom and help to serve. Because sometimes serving will look like correcting someone, a brother and sister who's living in sin. Sometimes serving will just be shutting up and listening. Sometimes serving is crying and laughing. Sometimes serving is investing money to someone who is hurting financially. Whatever that form of service is, ask God to use it to restore and build people up. If it's a non-believer, ask God that the gospel would be shown through your actions, that it would make an opportunity for you to share the gospel to restore that person. If it's a believer, ask God to use your service to help encourage them, to build them up, to mature them and sanctify them. We might not see the results right away. We might see the results next week. Someone might tell us uh, how you might have helped them. The results might take 10 years like it did for my friend and his parents. We might go a whole lifetime of not seeing the results. But as you go forward in your service, trust in God that your service is not in vain and that he is using it to restore and build up his people and his kingdom. Just knowing the example of service, you know, that we see in Jesus... And knowing the reason for our service is not enough to help us sometimes because it can get really difficult. We get hurt, we get offended, and we get abused. We get taken advantage of. We get tired and worried because we have a lot of our own problems as well. So where do we get the strength, the patience, the love, the courage? Where do we get the ability for serving? And to simply put, is Jesus Christ. We look, to the, we look to Christ and the cross for strength, patience, and courage, and ability to serve as God desires for us for, to serve. We don't do it on our own. We do it with Christ. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 to 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus this being the mind of humility, the mind of humility that Christ has, have this same mind among you, who Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the the cross." There is a striking similarity between these words by Paul and Jesus' actions in John. We see that Jesus took, out his, took off his outer, outer garment and tied a, a towel around his waist, taking the form of a servant. In a similar way, Jesus left his glory in heaven and came down to earth and took on human flesh to take the form of a servant. And when he came down here, what did he do? He washed the feet of his loved ones. And then the next day, he humbled himself even lower, obeyed the Father's will, and went to that cross knowingly and willingly 
for us. He did this to give us new life, and he, give, he did this to restore us back to God. Remember, our passage is uh, in the upper room the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And he, Jesus was fully aware of what was going to happen the morning after. And if it were you or I, probably we might have sounded something like this. Hey, Peter, tomorrow I'm going to have a really bad day. So why don't you come here and wash my feet? Because tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and one of you who I've poured all my time and energy and love into is going to betray me with a kiss. And then after that I'm going to be arrested and I'm going to be dragged around and humiliated. I'm going to be falsely accused. I'm going to be wrongly sentenced to death and to death on the cross. And people are going to mock me, they're going to spit on me, they're going to beat me, they will be, their eyes will be full of hatred. All for what? For nothing. I didn't deserve it. And then after that, I'm going to have to drag a cross through the city, and I'm going to have my nails driven into that cross, and I will be crucified. They're going to put a crown of thorns on my head, not for what I've done, but for what you've done. And now I'm going to stay there in the full wrath of God the Father, my Father who I've been in perfect, loving fellowship with for eternity, his full wrath is going to come down on me. Again, not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done in your sin. This is what I'm facing tomorrow. But nevertheless, I'm going to take off my outer garment. I'm going to get down and wash your feet. And the next morning, I'm going to go through all of that because I love you. And you are mine. I'm going to do this so that you are restored with me. I'm going to do this so that I dwell in you and you dwell in me. And this is the source of our service. It comes from Christ. It comes from his example. It comes from his power. For us to serve, we need to be in union with Christ. John Hindley in his book, Serving Without Sinking, he says, if your service of Christ has grown grudging or stopped happening, you don't need to try to obey more. You need to love more. This means that you don't need to try harder. You need to ask your Father to send His Spirit to work in your heart to make you more loving. You need Him to work in you so that you can increasingly enjoy the goodness of Jesus, appreciate the service of Jesus, and let Jesus recapture your heart with his love. It's all about being in union with Jesus. Other religions will tell you it's, it's, it's just one way. You serve God and you serve others and maybe you'll be good enough to get into heaven or reach nirvana or whatever there is, that, whatever they're offering. But Christianity, it's two ways and it starts with God. It's God who loved us first. It's God who came down. It's God who served us. It's God who died on the cross for us so that we could be in union with each other. Our service overflows from that. Christ is the example. He is the reason. And he is the ability that we are able to serve. Let's pray, church.